going to talk about three words today. Three words that are a phrase that have become one of the most culturally destructive uh, mandates in this culture. Now, if we could change these words, we would change the world. But in order to rewire and reframe these words, you need some kind of laboratory. You need some kind of delivery system to make us practical. So I'm going to take my three words, and I'm going to dump them into the world of sports. Why sports? Well, think about the role that sports plays in the globe and in America. Sports will engage more individuals, more families, more communities in a shared activity than any cultural activity, organization, or religion in America. It has become the secular religion of this society. And there's a transmission of values, the transmission of this phrase that does tremendous amounts of, of, uh, of destruction. Second reason, sports, historically, sports have always been a metaphor for social change. Until recently, when we've got moved into this win-at-all-cost kind of mentality, sports have always been a way to integra integrate in immigrants into American culture. Every ethnic group that's ever been ghettoized, sports has created a way out of that ghetto. When you talk about civil rights, when you talk about women's rights, when you talk about human rights, you think of the role that sports and athletics have helped to play to bring them into the political and mainstream consciousness. I want to take my redefined uh, phrase and have sports move that out. So what is the phrase? I want to say it's the three scariest words that every man receives in his lifetime. And the phrase is, to be a man. And I'd ask every man listening to this, you think about the context when you were young and someone told you to be a man. It was almost always in the context of, stop acting that way. Stop with the tears, stop with the emotions. Don't be some kind of mama's boy, some kind of sissy. Be a man. And what young boys are taught at a very early age, that in order to be a man, they've got to separate their hearts from their heads. Boys are taught that to have emotions, to show them, to shear them, to emote them. Somehow those things are considered signs of masculine failure. So we have this massive repression of the very thing that makes us human, makes us contributors in this world. So let me show you what the socialization process looks like in America. Five, six, seven years old, every boy is given that mandate. Then this enculturation process gives every boy three fundamental lies about what it means to be a man. The same lies that were fed to me when I was a boy are being fed to boys today. And the first lie is this, and I think every boy in America learns this by the time they're seven, eight, nine years old. They learn this on ball fields and playgrounds and during recess all over their community. That is, as a culture, we associate masculinity with athletic ability or size or strength or some kind of skill set that allows you to compete on that playground and win. So what happens for those boys that have athletic interests and abilities that can catch the down and out, hit the hanging curve, those boys are elevated in, on that playground. They're given a little more value, a little more worth. They're even ascribed a little more masculinity. And what I want to say, that is an absolute lie. Being a man doesn't have a single thing to do with athletic ability, size, strength, or the cat capacity to compete and win. Second lie every boy in America learned today by the time they're in junior high school, and that is we associate masculinity with issues of sexual conquest. What's it mean to be a man? It means you can bring some young girl alongside of yourself and then use her. Use her to either gratify some kind of physical need or use her to validate some kind of masculine insecurity. That certainly doesn't make you a man. That makes you a user of other human beings. Then later on, you get the third line of this culture, and that is we associate masculinity with issues of economic success, as though you can measure what a man is based on his job title, his position, power, or the amount of possessions someone has accumulated. That, too, is a fundamental lie. The problem is we live in a society where all kinds of men associate their self-worth with their net worth. Now, I could take those three lies and tie them into just about every psychosocial problem we have in this country. And I don't care whether it's girls with babies, boys with guns, immorality in boardrooms, or the beatdown women take in America. These three lies are embedded in almost every advertisement that's connected to sports that's directed at men. We've got to figure out how do you redefine, reframe this term of what it means to be a man. 
So once you're given those uh, socialization process, every boy's given the mandate, that then produces a thing called alexithymia. Alexithymia is a mental health designation. It's a Latin word. Ah means without, lex means words, thymia is emotions and feelings. It's an inability to put your emotions and feelings into words. The American Psychological Association would say 80% of American men suffer from some form of alexithymia. Where does it come from? It comes from the fact when we were five, six years old, we were told to stop with the emotions, stop with the feelings, never given permission to emote, to develop a vocabulary, to even name our feelings as well. And this is where most of the social problems begin. Because if you don't understand your own feelings, your own emotions, you'll never understand the feelings of emotions of another human being. Self-understanding is critical to understanding. This creates an empathy deficit disorder an inability to understand what other people are feeling and what causes those feelings. Uh, this is the precursor for bullying, for hazing, for dating abuse, gender violence, for violence all over America. So this then creates kind of a, uh, you have the socialization, the mandate, you have the alexithymia, and then that creates kind of a covert masculine depression. It's covert, all you see are the three footprints. The first thing you see there is isolation the tremendous number of men that do not know how to enter into meaningful relationships with another human being. And whenever you see the moral failure of men in media almost every day, it's always because they lack one meaningful relationship to give some kind of accountability, some process with the temptations, the issues that people are dealing with. Second thing you see is substance abuse. I don't think there's anything more painful than feeling like you don't quite measure up as a man. And given the cultural definition, you'll never have a long enough athletic career, you'll never sleep with enough women or make enough money to ever feel fulfilled and satisfied by that. So men start to medicate the pain of not feeling man enough. Alcohol, drugs, sex, materialism, pornography, whatever men need to attach to in order to feel secure about their own masculinity. Then the third thing, footprint up there is violence. America is one of the most violent nations in the world. Men have been using violence to get over for generations. But you think about the violence perpetrated on girls and women in this country. Uh, gender violence is a male crime of power and control. Uh, uh, men have been using violence, and violence is a nothing more than unprocessed grief. And as I said, that boys that can't cry shoot bullets. So if that's the lies of masculinity, then what does it mean to be a man? How do you define masculinity? When we tell a boy to be a man, we ought to have some kind of clear and compelling definition that's going to help guide his own masculine soul as he moves through this world. So let me give you my definition of masculinity. I think masculinity comes down to two things and two things only. And they're really the same for a, a women as well because it's really about our common humanity. Now, I learned this not only through my own life process, but I've been in pastoral ministry for almost 30 years now. And in my faith tradition, part of my job is to sit on the deathbed of dying people and help prepare them for the next stage of life, if you will. And here's what I know to be true for me, and I know to be true for every single man out there. If you were on your deathbed today, knowing that you were going to die tomorrow, and you wanted to measure what kind of man you were, what kind of success you had in life, it come down to two things and two things only. And the first is this. On that deathbed, you recognize that all of life is about relationships. It's about the capacity to love and to be loved. What's it mean to be a man? It means you can look somebody in the eye and say, I love you, and receive that love back. You know what the questions you ask at the end of your life? They're not about awards or achievements or applause or what you accumulated. They're all questions of relationships. What kind of husband was I? What kind of father? What kind of partner? What kind of son? What kind of friend? Who did I love and who did I allow to love me? Now you think about that socialization process of men in this country. Men aren't raised to be relationally successful. We're taught how to compare and compete with all the wrong definitions of what it means to be a man. You know what happens on that playground? Seven, eight-year-old boys already mandated to be a man, starting to repress, socialize, we start walking around that playground and boys police each other. And they want to find that one boy that's just a little too soft, just a little too gentle. And then we all gang up on that boy. 
And we tell that boy to stop acting that way. Stop with those tears. Stop with the emotions. Don't be a sissy. Be a man. And then as eight and nine-year-old boys, we walk away from that experience thinking, my goodness, I hope that never happens to me. And we start conforming, building out this facade, this machismo, in order to defend and deflect questions about our own masculinity. Now, what would happen in Baltimore in America if all the individuals, all the institutions came together and said this next generation of boys, we're going to teach them the essence, the epitome of what it means to be a man emanates from the heart. It's the heart that allows for attachment. It's the heart where passion, it's the heart where values, empathy, compassion resides. It's all about the heart that needs to be nurtured. First thing, it's all about relationship. Second thing about masculinity, again, if you're on your deathbed today, about to die tomorrow, wanted to measure what kind of man you were, what kind of success you had in life, it'd come down to this. At the end of your life, you want to be able to look back over life and know that you made a difference. You left some kind of mark, some kind of imprint that you were here. All of us want to leave some kind of legacy behind. Legacies are always built around two things. They're always built around relationships, and the second thing, they're always built around some kind of commitment to a cause. Every one of us has a responsibility to give back, and it's a challenge of every man, every woman to identify their own unique cause in life and how they're going to make a difference in this world. It's all about relationships and commitment to a cause. So what would happen again if all the coaches, all the athletic leagues, we not only nurtured boys' heart, rewired them uh, to live out of their hearts, wholehearted living, but we also helped them to discover their own cause, their own unique contribution in life. It's all about relationships, and it's all about commitment to a cause. So think about that for a moment in the context of sports. What is a team? A team is nothing more than a set of relationships for a cause. Every team has a common purpose. It's got performance goals and objectives. There's some kind of mutually accountable work ethic. But every team is always built around the trust, the respect, the integrity, the dignity of every team member. If a team is a set of relationships for a cause, boy, then that is an ideal place to help boys become men and guide and nurture. So my solution to many of the problems that we face in America today is we need to reframe uh, uh, of sports. We need to redefine what it means to be a coach. And then we've got to rewire broken men that have separated their hearts from their head, and they've got to get connected. And then we've got to do the preventive work. As every young boy grows up, we've got to give them affirmations. We've got to give them some kind of validation about all of their emotions, all their feelings, all of their humanity. So the next time, the next time you see some man, some young boy, struggling with the tears, with the emotions, boy, you think what would happen in this world if we walked up to that person and said, way to be a man, because men live out of the fullness of who and what they are. They live out of their hearts. And somewhere we've got to change the cultural milieu in here to make sure that when we tell a boy to be a man, we give him a clear, compelling definition. Masculinity, relationships, commitment to a cause. Thank you.